The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, astronaut murderer pleads guilty but totally alienated. All this science I don't understand, he says. It's just my job, five days a week. So I killed him on Saturday. Man caves in the sky, or man caves in the sky, and hot pumpkin pie. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. We continue our great roundtable discussion talking about the late great grandmaster of science fiction, Jerry Pornell. Out now at Booksellers is The Best of Jerry Pornell, edited by John F. Carr. We have with us John F. Carr, and we have two of Jerry Pornell's sons, Alex Pornell and Philip Pornell. It's a wonderful discussion of Jerry Pornell's life and work. This is part two of a two-part discussion, by the way. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's great high fantasy novel, Son of the Black Sword. Now here's the news. We have new fiction and nonfiction at the Bain.com website for your reading enjoyment. The November free fiction is A Visit to the Galaxy Ballroom, which is a new story in the Leaden universe by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. It also serves as a bit of an announcement of December's new Leaden universe novel, Accepting the Lance. Dance the night away at the Galaxy Ballroom. Scout Lena Yobingham just spent the last nine days babysitting council appointee administrative arbiter of Scouts Chola as Barta to Sherbleek. As if that wasn't bad enough, doing so meant missing festival on Liad. Now she finds herself with 24 standard hours of free time to spend any way she chooses, so long as she doesn't stray far from the spots that scouts are supposed to hang out. Well, the Galaxy Ballroom fit the bill, and had the best bowling ball lanes to boot. But, as Lena will soon find out, there's something mysterious going on beneath the surface of the galaxy. The new Bain.com nonfiction is very interesting space stuff, speculating on very large object engineering this time. That piece is called Man Caves, Humanity's Next Home by Ken Roy. Home away from home. Colonizing different planets has long been a dream, but finding new habitable worlds ready for the settling has proved far more difficult than once thought. And terraforming, as it is commonly discussed, comes with its own set of roadblocks. But there's another solution. If humankind wants to move off our terrestrial home, shell worlds. In this month's nonfiction essay, engineer Kenroy explains how this unique approach might help us move out into the stars sooner than we imagined. Man Caves, Humanity's Next Home by Kenroy and A Visit to the Galaxy Ballroom by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller are now up for your reading pleasure at thebane.com front page. And if you come to this later, you can find them both in our ebook collections available at Bain.com. These are Free Stories 2019 and Free Nonfiction 2019, which can both be downloaded for free at Bain eBooks. So check them out. This is part two of a two part interview. Part one is available on last week's podcast. want to welcome John F. Carr, Philip Pornell, and Alex Pornell to the podcast. Hello, guys. Hi. Howdy. Howdy. John F. Carr is the author of seven published novels, and along with co-editor Jerry Pornell, he has edited over 20 theme anthologies and short story collections. He's also an authority on the life and works of H. Beam Piper, and uh, I believe you're, the, you're in charge of the estate as well, right, John? No, I'm not in charge of the estate, but I've got the uh, a, a website that um, we call it the H. Uh, Beam Piper Memorial website that uh, talks ah. about Beam, and you know, uh, I'm sort of the uh, locus for Piper stuff since I've written two biographies on him. 
And your other works include Space Opera, Ophidi Ophidian Conspiracy, and several novels, um, some co-written with Roland Green, um, some set in the Paratime universe of H.P. and Fiber. Yeah, and I've got a couple of Space Viking uh, novel sequels and uh, a lot of Lord Calvin books, <laughs> about seven of them. And you are also the editor. You're well known for, for working with Dr. Jerry Fornell, um, which is what we'll be talking about, of course. And you're the editor of uh, this great new anthology that we have out uh, collection. Uh, well, let me go on. Philip Hornell was a Navy surface warfare officer, a military advisor to the Department of Defense's Office of Net Assessment. I think ONA is defense, right, um, for several years. And he now works as a, a consulting uh, as a consultant, as director for gaming, war gaming and analysis for uh, long term strategies. Is that the name of the company, Phil? Yes, the long term strategy group. It's uh, here in DC, and uh, we provide you know, analysis uh, on long term strategies and uh, you know, looking out uh, 20, 30 years in the future. And uh, that's after 26 years uh, serving in the Navy. Phil is the son of, of Jerry Pornell, and we also have Alex Pornell, who is uh, IT project manager. Um, he's consultant now, and he assisted uh, Jerry Pornell for for many years writing that column for Byte that um, that we all knew and loved. Um, out now at booksellers everywhere is the best of Jerry Pornell, the collected tales of a science fiction legend, uh, edited by John F. Carr. And I thought we'd um, we could talk about the collection and also just talk about Dr. Pornell a little bit, um, since y'all are the most qualified uh, collection of people in the world to talk about this. <laughs> so, that was uh, yeah. Tell us how that. So there was always this. Pro all right, there was two books that Pornell Jerry Pornell wrote, and then he wrote some with Sterling. And then, um, but he had this final book that was that was his alone, that was going to be the final book in the Janissary series, right? Um, can you tell us the the history of that, the genesis? So he had started the book. Uh, in fact, you look at the contract; it's you know basically ten years overdue. And you have to keep in <laughs> mind that he had, uh, you know, a couple things that slowed him down. The first was uh, he had. Uh, a lump in his head. Now we suspect it was cancer, but since they never got a hold of it, they don't know for certain. And they had to treat it with uh, hard radiation to uh, uh, shrink it down, and then it went away. Um, and but this, of course, had effects on the on his uh, body, both before uh, it was determined what it was, and then afterwards, uh, both uh, affected him. And the hard radiation uh, really. Uh, slowed him down, but that meant that he was merely human at this point because, uh, as John alluded to, he was just um, vociferous and, and voluminous. I mean, just, just the, what he could produce was just uh, 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 amazing, uh, you know, but now he was merely human, so that slowed him down in that regard. And then, of course, uh, uh, later he had the, the stroke, and that had also um, slowed him down. But even then, he had about the book about 80% uh, uh, complete. And when we say 80% complete, it's still a very uh, big book and uh, a lot of notes. And then, um, uh, and then of course, he went to Dragon Con and had a great time and came home and said, you yeah, know, I'm uh, feeling a little under the weather, so I'm going to go take a nap. And um, he unfortunately didn't uh, wake up, but of course, you know, that is the way to go, so to speak. You know, uh, yeah. uh, have a great time with your friends and then uh, uh, sleep in, fall asleep in your own bed. Um, so the book was about 80% done uh, and quite a bit of notes. Uh, and uh, it needed to be finished. So um, I started reading through it and uh, seeing where his notes and the, the arc of the story uh, went. And uh, then talked to... Uh, Tony at Bain uh, Books, and she uh, brought in uh, uh, David Weber to uh, help uh, finish the, the, the story out. So um, I did an initial draft of the, of the, uh, the story and, and uh, completion, and 
you know, using dad's notes, I, of course, um, wrote uh, to to get to a particular point that he had in his notes, and uh, uh, the darn thing was longer than the other three books uh, combined. Uh, so uh, Tony quite rightly said, you know, you need to kind of stop uh, here. And so uh, um, I did, you know, I rolled it back to a particular uh, <laughs> uh, very important battle scene. And uh, and then um, uh, David uh, uh, stepped in and there and uh, uh, worked on the work, worked on it. And then we uh, received what he had done with it. And I was just like, wow, this is this is uh, I, I think I got it to be a pretty darn good book. But uh, David certainly helped uh, just bring it over the top. And uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it's going to be a great story and it will uh, be published in June. Yeah, um, the name of the book is Mameluke. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I want to interject a little bit because uh, somewhere along the line, I talk, I had talked to Phil, and he sent me the final or one of the final manuscripts, which included most of what Jerry had written and a lot of what uh, Phil had added on. And I'm going to tell you, Phil, you impressed the hell out of me. There were parts I couldn't tell where your dad stopped and you started. And, you know, I've known Phil most of his life. I I published his first story in one of the War World novels, and I've watched him grow up from a boy to a a very impressive young man, and now, I guess, an elderly, an older man. I mean, not to date myself too badly. And I'm telling you, Phil, you did a great job with your draft, and I'm not only looking forward to seeing the final book, but I'm looking forward to seeing further adventures because I think the book is in wonderful hands and I don't think anybody is going to be anything other than absolutely entertained by what they read. That's going to be our big summer offering uh, that that we expect to be our summer uh, blockbuster, <laughs> which will be out in June. Uh, and yeah, and it's uh, it's got a beautiful cover. It's going to be great. Um, and definitely want to talk more about that when it comes out, by the way, on the podcast. So uh, let me, since since you're talking about the working on stuff your dad, uh, both of both of you Pornell sons, um, and you're, you're mentioning like, you know, it, he slowed down to be a normal. What is it like to be raised by this, this polymath genius sort of fellow um, who um, is also really socially adept in a certain way and bringing people together. And, you know, it's like a, a whirlwind that, that was your father. Um, how did it shape your life? Uh, I mean, we don't need a giant disquisition, but maybe a pricey from, from y'all, um, because it's really interesting. I'd like to, to know. I think a lot of people would. Well, for me, it's kind of hard to know what to compare it to because it's all I've ever known. Uh, certainly, uh, it was a very inclusive family in the, that all our friends were were felt, if not part of the family, it's certainly uh, very near to it. And the nearly everybody who was uh, who who came over was given a fair hearing. I mean, you know, of course, obviously he was. Let's be fair highly opinionated, but he would almost always listen to what people said and he would, you know, he would give as good as he got, but he taught himself to listen more than, than people's reputations, uh, you know, their understanding of him. I, I believe most of those are incorrect or they saw him on bad days. Uh, so it was, you know, it was always time to bring your A game to dinner. That's for sure. Bill, what do you think? You were sitting on the other side of the table. Yeah, I'd certainly want to bring uh, your A game if you're going to have an argument with Dad or Mom or anyone else for that matter. My my two uh, biggest memories um, was not only at the dinner table, these fascinating um, discussions. And as a side note, even like uh, the church we went to, uh, Father Evans would give these uh, disposition uh, like uh, uh, sermons and and then he and dad would have these I have a short sermon afterwards. of only 17 points this time yes yeah. they, they tend to be pretty heavy <laughs> flooding um 
But the other part of it was uh, the amount of time Dad spent with us in the Boy Scouts. Dad became the hike master for our uh, scout troop and would prepare us for these uh, long-term backpacking trips in the uh, uh, Sierra Madres and other places, Uh, you know, 50-mile, 75-mile hikes, you know, these Boy Scouts from 11 to 18 and the training hikes to prepare us uh, for, uh, you know, the pacing and the altitude and, and other things. And just the amount of time that he had uh, spent with us and the other uh, scouts uh, doing that was just certainly a, uh, you know, formative element of of, uh, my life. The other part about it is all the honorary uncles that we had. Um, We would go to science fiction conventions all around the country and, and up in Canada and places. And... Uh, we were kind of let loose uh, in this environment. But we had all these honorary uncles that, uh, you know, like uh, Uncle Paul, uh, Uncle Robert, (laughs) these other uh, uh, um, authors that, you know, looked out for us. And then there were a large number of honorary uncles also within uh, fandom, Uh, Sarge and Scratch, and I can give a whole bunch of other nicknames for for other people that uh, looked out for us uh, because they were friends of Dad, but it was also back when fandom was a very much a a uh, family-like environment. So, um, at times, yes, Dad could be um, a very imposing uh, a figure, and he'd be very busy. And so there was some, uh, you know, some some gaps between us. But there was also this extended family that was uh, um, looking out for us the whole time. Cool. So that certainly extended to both the science fiction community and, for that matter, the science journalism and, um, and for that matter, the computer science, uh, well, computer journalism, let's be more accurate, world. Uh, one of the th- stories that one – the, one of the privileges I had was during the uh, Viking missions, uh, I was dad's sidekick up at JPL back when – that meant that you were, you know, pushing among the national news because uh, science was big, even unmanned science. And I was, I don't know, 15 to to 17, and we rode over there for uh, first on the back of his motorcycle, then on a car, because when you're bringing a computer, it's hard to do it on the motorcycle. And he was certainly very early in the days of having a computer. He wrote about that in Byte quite a bit, as well as in other places, and that certainly informed his Galaxy column. And in that sense, he was part of yet a different community. He was part of the science journalism community, which was essentially, uh, you know, there, there's a lead through from that to AAAS, as John talked about earlier, but but is essentially yet a different community that he was perfectly at home in. And that ability to figure out how to fit in uh, to there are many others that we could mention communities certainly helped inform my life that he would make a conscious decision. I realize now I didn't see it at the time. It just, you know, it just like, looked like that's what you did to, to fit in and ingratiate yourself to hear what others have to say and to learn from them. And that approach certainly I've tried to emulate for good or ill in my life as I've, in some ways followed him in, in those communities and or gone in, on my own way. And that probably is a good portion of what I learned in addition to the Boy Scout stuff that uh, that Phil talked about and going on a hand-built sailboat uh, from to, to Catalina multiple times and many other adventures, the driving adventures, the, 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 the trip that uh, we made to the uh, – 91 Eclipse in Phil's truck that he didn't get a ticket to go on, things like that that were adventures endlessly throughout our uh, 
lives. We didn't think about them being adventurous. It was just what you did. And that, that, you know, excitement at doing it, but not excitement that it was different, if you will, to help, you know, help shape me who I am. Right. And that so reminds like me of those Voyager out. encounters. That, uh, yes, go ahead. I, I'm sure you boys remember those, the Voyager encounters. And uh, that was a lot of fun because it, it gave Jerry, uh, NASA, uh, the, or JPL, the people from JPL approached Jerry because a lot of them were science fiction fans. And, uh, and Jerry was quite well known in the area, so he was approached by the people at JPL to invite science fiction writers to JPL for the Voyager encounters. And uh, I got involved because Jerry didn't have time to do the actual invitation. So he said, John, here's who I want to come. And if you can think of anybody, throw them in. And we would invite uh, Robert Heinlein, uh, local people like Robert Block and Harlan Ellison, uh, Poole Anderson, uh, Gordy Dixon, Mac Reynolds, all these. Jack Williams. Um, Jack Williams, yes, the cream of the crop of the, of the science fiction. And we would all invite them to these JPL encounters. And by God, most of them would show up. And I was kind of in charge of making sure that they would all have places to stay and, and knew what was going on and keep them in, you know, in touch with the events. And then uh, Jerry would throw a big party, and he'd have them all over at uh, Chaos Manor, and uh, we'd all get a chance to mingle. And I'll tell you, I met some – I mean, almost everybody you could think about in those days, from Harlan Ellison to – to Norman Spinrad and and Jack Williamson and just about everybody would show up for those because they were the highlight of the year. I mean, because you would get to go to JPL, we would get to go with the press, and we were there when those images were being transmitted right there at Von Karman Center. And let me tell you, it's pretty exciting because they didn't have the memory we have today. So only about one out of every four or five of those were actually preserved at that point in time. So a lot of those pictures we were seeing as they were flying by Jupiter and Saturn were gone. I mean, you had to be there to see them. And, we, and, and there were scientists walking around commenting on this stuff and saying, oh, look at that feature. And, and they're surrounded by science fiction writers. And then, then the sci- and they're talking to the science fiction writers. Well, what do you guys think of this? And I mean, it was fascinating. It was absolutely unprecedented. And only Jerry could have pulled it off. I mean, nobody else had the uh, the credentials in the science community as well as the science fiction community to merge those two groups together like that and bring it off as four or five times as a total success. Uh, those are some of the highlights of my life. I'll never forget some of the people I met. I mean, sitting down and talking to Ted Sturgeon at, at, at the cafeteria at Von Karman Center and talk, meeting his wife, Jane, and, and then having, you know, the God, you know, spin rad show up and and go. Oh, hi, hi, Ted. And didn't even know these guys knew each other that well. And it turns out they were good friends. And it was it was just a lot of fun. It was uh, a very special and unique time, and it won't ever happen again. <laughs> that is so cool to hear about. Well, let me ask y'all all an impossible question of each you, probably, which is. Um, what is of let's talk about Jerry Pornell's writing a little what of his writing is either your favorite or something that is um incredibly memorable you think is incredibly influential um something that um that is just uh i don't know uh special to you a book or a story or even a nonfiction piece. Well, I mean, for me, it would have to be the Mercenary series, because uh, when I read the the original Mercenary, the Falkenbergs, right. And when I read the Mercenary, which was the uh, originally appeared in Analog, and I was a subscriber in the early 70s, and this is before I met Jerry, and 
the reality he presented in that book and the hard choices that uh, John Christian Falkenberg had to make just came alive to me. I mean, I could, I, it was like I was there. I really enjoyed that, and that that uh, became probably my favorite uh, series of his, uh, although I w- must say Jana series is a close second, you know, having been there is, at the birth I mean, of that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is, well my, uh, in terms of uh, growing up, the um, the book that uh, struck me, and quite often is the first book I would suggest to anyone who is not a, uh, familiar with science fiction about, you know, hey, what should I read first, is Lucifer's Hammer. Because it is a, it's a disaster scenario. Uh, the only science fiction element of it is just this uh, uh, comet. Um, and uh, maybe a little bit about the uh, uh, astronauts but other than that it's uh, it's just a, a a disaster novel and i think really a, a, a approachable for many people and it was one of the first uh, books of his that I, I i read now today um i'm biased by my most recent experience that the stories that i am um you know very firmly in my mind because i'm 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 playing in that playground is the Jana series uh, series and the and then the, the Mamluks book that I I worked on um, in that I am uh, uh, you know when you read it you'll hopefully you'll see it um, I'm having a couple arguments with Dad um, basically relayed through the views of different characters about uh, about particular uh, things. And so, uh, for me, it's, uh, you know, I miss it. And, uh, but I can have those mm-hmm. uh, conversations that uh, Alex was alluding to around the table. You know, if you're going to have an argument with Dad, bring your A-game. It's just that... Uh, mm-hmm. It's not as much of a two-way conversation as it was. For me, it's definitely Star Swarm, which is, in my mind, you know, it's a it's a standalone book. It doesn't exist in a larger universe. Or if, it, if it's a larger universe, it's one we don't know about. But it is a, you know, a Lost Boy t- uh, title. It's effectively, to me, it's a combination of... Citizen of the Universe and uh, Heinlein's Juveniles, in the sense of here's a lost young man trying to find his way, and many larger things are happening around him that you learn about, and you learn a much larger truth about the about the universe he lives in. But it was very personal to me that it was in some ways him talking about his past, even though I don't think the the incident with the pond and the the uh, natural glycerin, glycerin is in there, but many other things of growing up on a farm and being young in a time when nobody had any money, those things inform that book for me. I, I would say that's that's definitely the one that I remember most fondly. Do you want to, Alex, maybe, I think you, you were the one that was said that maybe, for instance, uh, Drew Pornell's attitude toward, uh, say, war was somewhat misunderstood, or his, you, you alluded to the fact that he's he's caricatured sometimes. Um, you want to speak to that a little bit, or what What was? Well, and he, he would usually talk about it in, shall we say, the third person, you point out that Mr. Heinlein was called a free love nut after a stranger and a total war, uh, warmonger after Starship Troopers. That's why they call it acting, my dear sir. But he certainly, <laughs> he saw the elephant, to use the phrase. He, he certainly saw combat. He saw his own men die and many around him, a, a thing that that is not very common these days, thank God, and, and I haven't. Uh, and so those attitudes there certainly translated through his life because, oh, yeah, he was doing 
science policy and operational analysis for the Air Force. He he was looking at what the Air Force's future was like, and he knew the cost in both blood and treasure, and for that matter, in emotional damage to those who were who were out on the on the sharp edge, and that informed both the the small part, the, that is to say, the the tactical the the discussions in you know mercenary as well as the larger operational strategic uh discussions that he would have both of the both the so-called Star Wars speech and a book called Strategy of Technology that he and Dr. Stefan Pisoni wrote which was incredibly influential it was a text that the the Air Force for a long time Air Force Academy for a long time so those uh you know remembering the I guess the you know the glory and uh, appeal of war as well as the horrors absolutely informed him and and those costs never entirely lost him he wouldn't talk about it much but it was clear that it that it meant a great deal to him so I don't think that anybody who cast him as a mindless warmonger really understood what he was about or that they what do you think is the most wrote. Yeah, I, I, I think one of the key what things you, when you go ahead. actually read the mercenary, you read Janissaries. In every of these stories, he, I think, quite purposefully and meticulously, put in the human cost in that the description of the smell of blood, the screams of of, of men, the nightmares of many of the characters that. Uh, who lived through these experiences, he put that in there. And uh, I think the key elements in, in one of the Falkenberg uh, uh, novels was um, the, you know, Falkenberg curses the mayor of, uh, of this one city that failed to do what he needed to do to uh, make the uh, colony survive properly and forced uh, Falkenberg's hand to a slaughter um, and that was distasteful to him. Um, but I think he was trying to get across is that, uh, you know, war is actually a very horrible thing, but the alternatives can be worse if uh, someone doesn't do their duty. And I think that I think one of the key messages in both the Falkenberg and, and some of the other, other stories, but he did not shy away from um, describing the horrors of it. And if anyone... Uh, I, I think people may have failed to read and truly understand uh, why he put those uh, descriptions in there. Please. Yeah, part of, of of what you were discussing was <clears throat> in the 70s, war, it was a huge anti-war movement in the 70s and early 80s. And a lot of it was almost an irrational response to Vietnam and our entanglement there. Uh, not realizing that Vietnam was just one little side affair in the in the night the Cold War, uh, and it was the one that was taking place at that point in time. And so, and unfortunately, that strategic element was never really pointed out in the press and made obvious to people. Whereas Jerry, had a, thanks to the strategy of technology, had a very good understanding of tactics. So when we started uh, writing uh, There Will Be War, we had a tremendous backlash. Number one, the title, There Will Be War. Well, guess who invented that title? It was Jim Bain. Because uh, he had done a couple of books at Ace just before he left with uh, Reginald Brentner called The Future at War. They did three volumes, and they were very successful, which surprised everybody, including Jim. So when Jim left Ace Books to become the editorial chief under Tom Doherty at Tor Books, uh, he had to leave behind everything he'd done up to that time. Uh, including the Janissaries books, which <laughs> always galled him. And so he called up Jerry, and they got into one of their famous three-hour conversations, and he said, Jerry, we got to have uh, uh, another war series, because I, I know you could do as good as Bretner, if not a hell of a lot better, because Bretner was never really uh, uh, an officer in the U.S. Army. 
And Jerry said, okay, that sounds like a good idea. And what do you want to call it? And he goes, we'll call it There Will Be War. And Jerry, I could hear him hooting up there, and I didn't know what was going on. About an hour later, he comes down to talk to me, and he goes, well, John, it looks like we're going to do a new anthology series for Bane. And I go, oh, great, because this, this was the fun part of my job, helping Jerry put these books together. And I said, what's it called, Jerry? And he goes, there will be war. <laughs> I just went, oh, my God, that's going to rattle everybody's chains. And he goes, I think that's the idea, John, but it's Jim's idea, and he's the marketing genius, so hell, we'll just put them out. And we, we put together nine volumes. And they were, and some of them went into multiple, multiple printings, and all of them made money. And we actually helped create the whole military genre at that point because, because of the anti-war backlash, nobody was really publishing it in uh, most of the other more quote liberal uh, SF lines. So uh, that was kind of a, a fun, another fun project where Jerry and Jim brainstormed up something that uh, that even got a counter anthology published by Harry Harrison called "There Will Be Peace" or some silly thing, and uh, it only came to one volume. <laughs> yeah, and we got a pretty good laugh well, out of uh... that. Uh, I'm sitting here looking, you know, I, I, my office is back here among the uh, old mass market archives and I'm looking at all of them right now that we have back here. So um, they're great. It's a great series. Um, maybe uh, to close it out uh, and we could add anything else that, that y'all think of, what is the most prescient thing that each, each of y'all think of that, that maybe science fiction idea? Possibly just a idea. Of course, they they come together. Um, that Jerry Pornell came up with that um, maybe even hasn't been considered to the point that it's going to affect the future in more ways than we even think of now. Um, and anything else you want to add? Well, I'll go I first. Want to start uh, off. Sure. Uh, for me, the fact that he effectively invented pocket computers in uh, in it's alluded to in in the, in the King David series, and it's certainly big in Moten God's Eye, and then the whole concept that any question to which an answer exists can be trivially found, which is, you know, obviously that's, there's a whole business of search, whether Google or Bing or DuckDuckGo or whatever your favorite search engine is. That, for me, was the... Uh, biggest ones he he was certainly very generous with uh credit he like i was much more impressed with the with the ideas that his partner uh larry niven came up with because larry invented a bunch of things that are already coming true we'll leave that for another time but for me it was definitely the pocket computer and access to all human information yeah no for me that uh, i one of the most exciting things was his contribution to the space program and the fact that Jerry was a huge proponent of space. And, I mean, I I've, I've still wonder why nobody's using the laser launch uh, elements that he invented for the uh, High Justice series. I mean, that, that instruct me as a technology whose time is certainly just around the corner, if not right here right now and i think if you know uh i think maybe someday there'll be a space colony and i think if they called it jerry purnell that would be the best thing he ever that ever happened to him because man he was a true visionary and he spent an immense amount of time with the L5 society and trying to to get man to the start back uh, a serious colony on the moon and even Mars. And, and to me, he was probably the, one of the great proponents of the whole space program. So I think the most important thing that he contributed is a sense of optimism. And I know this seems counterintuitive when you look at his, some of his stories, but, um, 
as John alluded to, the fact that he was fighting back against the Neo-Malthusian concepts of, of limits. And uh, when you read the uh, General Atomic stories and the, and the other stories uh, that he has there about how the inventiveness of, of, of man can overcome uh, these limitations, and in fact, some of these um, limitations that are self-imposed through uh, certain, uh, like I said, neo-Malthusian philosophies, you know, are what actually doom people to starvation and, and other conditions. And in addition to the pocket computer and other things, this uh, sense of uh, of uh, optimism is now coming forth. Uh, you know, and there's a lot of data behind it. There's a concept called dematerialization. Now, Dad didn't invent it, but it's a current description of, of something that he uh, foreshadowed in his stories in that as the computer-controlled um, construction systems have come online and become extremely precise, uh, we have had um, not only dematerialization in the fact that the, the iPhone that I'm calling you on you know, had replaced like a 50-pound phone, an answering machine, all sorts of other capabilities that uh, you don't use anymore because of, of the iPhone, not only in those lines, but also in terms of the precise, precise use of resources have meant that so many resources in our lives, we are um, post-peak consumption. You know, everybody worried about uh, peak oil, that we we're going to run out and peak and then it would drop off. Turns out we're peak oil consumption uh, has just dropped off uh, due to precision. Same thing for like water. You name the resource, like the top 100 resources that are, that are out there, uh, we are uh, using so less of it. And even the uh, unit per GDP has, has uh, dropped off uh, um, considerably because Malthus was wrong. That while it would appear from straight line um, uh, projections that you would run out of something that the ability of mankind to come up with uh, better abilities to use things or come up with new ideas we hadn't even thought of have completely overcome this uh, concept of uh, limit. So I think his, his greatest contribution, and it's all around us, but people don't necessarily see it, is this sense of optimism that if we do the work, if we get into the technology and really understand what's going on, we can uh, greatly improve uh, all of mankind. And uh, I, I think this it bears out with what's up all around us. But the fact that he was a prophet of this in the 70s when the Malays and all these other problems were on us, that to me is his uh, longest and enduring uh, contribution that we really should be optimistic uh, mankind can overcome um, almost every barrier except perhaps human nature itself. Yep. Or, to put it very succinctly, despair is a sin. Yes. Well, that's a wonderful way to end it. The book is The Best of Jerry Pornell, edited by John F. Carr. It's a great compendium of a lot of stuff that, that John has put together that really gives you a taste of um, of the wonderful work of um, this grand master and in, in everyone who counts eyes of science fiction. And I, I would like to say it is on the uh, national bestseller list right now. I just saw uh, the book scan report. It looks good. So uh, onward and upward. Um, so I want to thank uh, John F. Carr, Philip Pornell, and Alex Pornell for talking with us today about, um, about Jerry Pornell and his work. Thank you guys so much. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for having us. That was part two of a two-part interview. Part one is available on last week's podcast. Now we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa, book one in the saga of the Forgotten Warrior. After the War of the Gods, the demons were cast out and fell to the world. Mankind was nearly eradicated by the seemingly unstoppable beasts. Until the gods sent the great hero Ram Rowan to save them, 
He united the tribes, gave them magic, and drove the demons into the sea. But as centuries passed, the descendants of the great hero grew in number and power. They became tyrannical and cruel, and their religion nothing but an excuse for greed. The people rose up, and the surviving royalty and their priests were made castless, condemned to live as untouchables. The age of law had begun. Ashok Vidal has been chosen by a powerful ancient weapon to be its bearer. He is a protector, a member of an ancient military order of roving law enforcers. No one is more merciless in rooting out those who secretly practice the old ways as Ashok. But Ashok isn't who he thinks he is. And when he finds himself on the wrong side of the law, the consequences lead to rebellion, war, and perhaps transformation. Now here is the latest entry in Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword. Chapter 45 Judging from the incredible racket, Asher could certainly made himself known. Even though they were only fighting against one man, it sounded to Keita like a mighty battle was being waged. A never-ending stream of horsemen had thundered past the inn, yelling their battle cries, but Keita really doubted the Somsak knew what they were getting into. He had once seen a protector single-handedly crush a rebellion, and that one hadn't been armed with an ancestor blade. Now's our chance, Keita said as he led his stolen horse from the barn. They wouldn't mount up until they were out of town. The ground was still too slick, and the sun hadn't melted much of the ice yet. The horses would have a hard enough time not falling down even without riders on their backs, so better to save them for later, when they'd have to run for their lives across the hills. After Ashok was dead, and the Somsak could afford to turn their attention elsewhere. Keita silently cursed himself as a coward, but what did the Forgotten expect him to do? The gods hadn't made him strong. What little magic he'd learned was as pathetic as his martial skills, and he had no black steel to call on anyway. His faith was weak. Keita was a bookkeeper. He was a glorified scribe for a prophet without faith. What would you have me do? Come on, you damn stupid thing. Thera was tugging on the reins, but her horse wasn't cooperating. All of the crashing, banging, and screaming throughout the town had terrified the poor animal. She smacked it to let it know she meant business. It tried to bite her, so she punched it in the snout. I'm not going to get caught over the likes of you. Shh. Keita saw movement on the other side of the inn. Not all of the Somsak had moved on yet. A few were more interested in terrorizing the locals and stealing their valuables than in seeking glory for their name against the legendary Black Heart. Soon enough, those moved on and the road was clear. Thera's horse began cooperating when it realized she was leading it in the direction away from the scary sounds. They started down the road. Luckily, it wasn't too steep, otherwise they might have slid all the way to the bottom of the mountain. It was terribly cold, but Keita was so flushed with fear that sweat was pouring down his face. They took one of the narrow paths through the tall rocks. With such a battle raging, all the Somsak would be distracted, so this was their best chance. The way back to the trade road appeared to be clear. Ashok has wanted to die all along. Who am I to try and stop him? Keita thought bitterly. So much for him being our general. Can't lead much after you've been hacked to pieces. Thera kept her voice down. She was trying to sound tough, but Keita could tell she was moved by Ashok's sacrifice. Despite her callous act, she cared far more for others than she let on. Ashok might not realize it yet, but I think I know why he saved those kids. It was probably best not to talk at all, but that was easier said than done when they'd just abandoned someone. What do you mean? The old Ashok, the one they built made out of lies and law, is starting to crumble. He's starting to see for himself, to be what he's really supposed to be. Or maybe I've been right all along and your forgotten is full of it. Or maybe I'm a coward who lacks the faith to do what must be done. Don't talk like that. If anyone shouldn't talk like that, it's you. Fine, you're the keeper. Thera threw her hands up in frustration. 
You're the one who's supposed to know what the words mean. You're the one who's supposed to testify and all that nonsense. That's right. I am. He'd always been a dreamer, but those dreams kept on getting crushed. For his dream to succeed, for his people to be free, someone had to be willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. He said, what's wrong? He hadn't even realized he'd stopped walking. Grant me courage, he prayed. I have to go back for Ashok. Are you mad? You're no warrior. No. Kita understood exactly what he had to do. I'm the keeper of names. So that means you need to die for no reason? I don't believe in your gods, but I do believe in your goals. So you picked the wrong man to be a general. So what? You'll find another. You'll make it work just like you always do. She tugged on her horse, and this time it was smart enough not to trifle with her. Now shut up and keep walking. But Kita couldn't move. Thera deserved to know the truth. I lied to you about last night's revelation from the voice. There was more. He reached into his coat and pulled out the transcript. She snatched it from him. Where'd you get off hiding that from me? Thera read. Here the path is set. Let my general begin his war. The world must remember what has been forgotten. My faithful servant will be sacrificed. A martyr. The testimony sealed in blood. She frowned. I hate the voice. I'm sorry. I was trying to protect you. Don't you see, Thera? We're the servants. Me, you, and Ashok. One of us is supposed to die here today. It can't be you or Ashok. You're both too important to the work. It has to be me. I've got to go back. Thera was staring at the paper. She looked like she was about to be ill. You're certain this is exactly what the voice said? I'm positive. There are no mistakes. And you just decided that one of us is supposed to die, and that's why you didn't try to stop Ashok. How is that your decision to make? I was scared, and he volunteered. And you think the gods would describe him as faithful? It has to be me, Kita said. The gods would choose a new keeper of names, but there was no one else like Ashok. Kita had to be prepared to die for his beliefs, like Ratul before him. I'm going back. Thera stared at him as she realized their long journey together was coming to an end. She was a fighter, and so her first inclination would be to fight him over it, but there was no time. She didn't even dare raise her voice too much. You're a stubborn fool. She shoved the paper roughly back at Keita. If this message is so damned important, Keeper, make sure it ends up in your book with the rest of your god's nonsense. I'm getting out of here. Thera stomped off, heading further down the hill. She might be furious at him now, but he was glad to see her leave. Thera had to escape. She was the most important of them all. Someday she would understand and believe. May the forgotten watch over you and keep you safe. Kita whispered as he prepared to go willingly to his death. But Thera reached the edge of the bluff and stopped. Below her would be the bridge and path back to the trade road. He was unsure why she paused. Kita could barely hear her as she muttered a long string of curses against Kita, his ancestors, and his god. Then Thera pulled on her horse and turned the reluctant animal back toward the village. She began walking uphill. I'm going back too, she snapped as she passed him. What? Why? He watched her, incredulous, as she struggled up the icy slope toward where hundreds of blood-crazed Somsak were rampaging. I'm the one that should be martyred. You need to stay alive. I know that, Thera snarled. I'm going back because the damned bridge washed out during the night. The river's too full, fast, and filled with ice chunks to cross. Feel free to stand here in the open until some tattoo-faced maniac puts an arrow in you. I intend to find another way out of this canyon.
That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And the substance slipperier than greased banana pills for use in gliding down that highway of life in high gear. Plus, thanks, praise, and gratitude to Philip Pornell, Alex Pornell, and John F. Carr, editor of The Best of Jerry Pornell. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. 